Good evening and welcome. My name is Christian Lewis and I'm the events coordinator for the AAAAV Access Network. For those of you who don't know, Access is the Institute's network for students and young professionals. We organise not only events, but produce two publications, MA, Monthly Access, and QA, Quarterly Access. Before I introduce tonight's keynote speaker, I would like to acknowledge other special guests that we have tonight with the ABC. Um, we are pleased to have uh, with us the recently announced chairperson of the ABC, the Honourable James Spiegelman, and the acting CEO of Radio Australia, Sue O'Hearn. Um, now to tonight's speaker. Dr Mike McCluskey is the acting director of ABC International. He holds a doctorate in media development and joined the ABC in Tasmania as rural reporter in the 1980s. He has worked in radio for over 25 years as a journalist, radio presenter and manager. He's also a very well-travelled person. Um, Organising this event was uh, quite interesting. I think the first time I rang Mike, he was um, about to go on radio live in Suva. Uh, second time I rang, he was in the airport coming back from some other nice location. And the third time, he was in the airport going somewhere else. So he's very well-travelled. Um, but uh, without further delay, I would like to introduce Dr Mike McCluskey. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much, Christian, and uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, the Honourable James Spiegelman, AC, QC, Chairman of the ABC. Uh, Les Rowe, where are you, Les? Uh, President uh, of AIIA Victoria. Lawrence Wade, Vice President. Uh, we have also uh, Peter McDermott, who is uh, Executive Officer with AIIA here in Victoria, and the National Executive Officer, Melissa Connolly-Tyler. Well, it is a great pleasure to talk about something that's very close to my heart, and that is our engagement with and relationship with Asia and the Pacific, and uh, how, it, how important it is for Australia. So this evening I'm going to talk to you about Australia and uh, how we as Australians think about ourselves, think about our position in the world, how we relate to our neighbours in Asia and the Pacific, and how important is it to have multilateral dialogue that is two-way engagement, mutual respect, understanding with one another as neighbours in Asia and the Pacific. I'm going to focus on why it's important to facilitate and encourage this dialogue, to develop a greater appreciation and understanding for the way in which we think about ourselves and the way that this affects our actions, our attitudes, our thoughts, our beliefs, our aspirations and ultimately our behaviour, and I'm talking both socially, politically and economically. Also how these actions lead to our neighbours forming perceptions of us. Who are we as Australians? What do we stand for? Or in their terms, what do they stand for? Can they be trusted? Can they, do they care about us in Asia or the Pacific? Do they understand us? Are they our friends? Or should we turn to our friends elsewhere who care more and understand us better? Now, these are important questions when you're thinking about your neighbours. Who you align with, who you trade with, who you play with, who you visit. Who will you invite into your place? So how are we perceived in Asia and the Pacific by our neighbours? Now, in any neighbourhood, there can be complete misconceptions about the people who live around us. I'm going to paint a picture of a British neighbourhood. I'm deliberately going to another part of the world here as an example of how easy it is to build perceptions or perhaps misconceptions about others based on limited knowledge and understanding. In this street, neighbours say there's a huge house. In this huge house is an extended family. Now, this family is run... Uh, by an old woman. She has a pack of dogs. A lot of people talk about these irritable dogs. She allows to run wild and terrorise the neighbourhood. She doesn't insure her car and uh, she doesn't even have a number plate on her car but she seems to have the police in her pocket because they won't do anything about it. The neighbours are resentful of her wealth because they say she's never held down a job. Her husband has a reputation of being rude when he thinks no one is listening. All the kids have broken marriages. Two grandsons have had respectable careers in the army, but they're much more uh, notable for partying and strange behaviour at nightclubs. 
None of the neighbourhood is ever invited into their home. These people seem elitist and even snobbish. And perceived in this way, of course, these neighbours think it isn't great living near Buckingham Palace. <laughs> now, this is despite the reality, of course, that the Queen is one of the most respected and admired people in the world. Now, this is just a metaphor meant not to be in any way insulting about the royal family, but to point out that people's perceptions can differ and in many ways be completely wrong depending on what they know, what they're told and what they perceive. So how do we in Australia want to be perceived as neighbours? Over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to outline how we at the ABC, in terms of our international coverage, represent ourselves to Asia and the Pacific in our neighbourhood and hopefully give a greater understanding of why this engagement with the region is so important. And I want to start with a brief summary of how Radio Australia and Australia Network TV, along with our international development arm, uh, represent you. Firstly, domestically, most Australians have a fairly good relationship with the ABC. It's a highly valued cultural and media institution. There's no question about that. And from time to time, or I should say from the time we're born, really, um, we, we've watched play school, children's programs, and then we move on to uh, things like Triple J in the teenage years. We do have some gaps where we don't have audiences, but by and large, people do tend to grow through certain products that the ABC has and touch base with it in different parts of their life until adulthood when ABC TV, radio and digital content uh, seems to offer fairly diverse offering to just about every age group. And so over these 80 years of existence, the ABC's told the story of Australia to Australians particularly well. The ABC is quintessentially Australian. It is seen as one of the prime cultural institutions of this nation, doing its best to reflect us to ourselves in all our diversity. But through radio, TV and digital platforms, the ABC International D Division is dedicated to making content for a very different audience or audiences with different interests and we connect with people across Asia and the Pacific who use media in a widely different way, in many diverse ways. So firstly to Radio Australia. It was founded in 1939 by the then Prime Minister Robert Menzies and he had this iconic phrase, the time has come to speak for ourselves. And that's exactly what we've been doing for the past 70 odd years. Over the decades, Radio Australia has evolved as the cultures, technologies, strategic objectives and media habits within Australia and within the region have changed. We currently provide news, information, educational content to Asia and the Pacific in English and seven regional language, languages. These are Chinese, or I should say Mandarin, Bahasa Indonesian, Vietnamese, Khmer in Cambodia, Burmese, Tok Pisin or Pigeon, and French. The reason we have these seven languages is because uh, when the budgets were severely cut in uh, 1997, a number of languages had to be uh, cut, and so these are the ones that survived, although Burmese was reintroduced or, um, in uh, about two years ago now, and uh, we have uh, very good audiences growing in Burma at the moment. Radio Australia also features the best content produced by the ABC domestically, which includes programs most of you would know, like AM, PM, uh, The Science Show, Health Report, major sports events, and uh, we do cover special events through our domestic partners in radio, in radio in Australia. In the Pacific, Radio Australia offers news and current affairs programs. We have live talk radio programming, uh, and that's across FM transmitters in a variety of different countries in the Pacific that allow people to access the content much more effectively than they could in the past with shortwave. Radio Australia also operates a pan-Pacific music competition which is dedicated to uncovering the best unsigned music uh, the Pacific has to offer and it's become very popular indeed. And in fact, we've uh, even saw, seen some people launching careers. We hope uh, they'll be successful as a result of this competition. Um, in Asia, Radio Australia provides news, current affairs programs as well as a lot of other information-based programs and we do those in Asian languages as well as in English. We have bilingual English language lessons, which offer a range of features that focus on Australia, 
the wider region and the broader issues including health, uh, I mean this is just a couple of examples, agriculture, women's issues and of course uh, major issues associated with the Millennium Development Goals. There's a broad array of diverse multilingual programming distributed to audiences in a variety of different ways. I've mentioned the FM transmitter network that goes into the Pacific, but we also have FM transmitters in a number of Asian countries, uh, and they are Laos, East Timor and Cambodia. And these are countries that effectively allow us, through licence operations, the ability to, uh, to get into, uh, have agreement to run local FM broadcasting. And they offer us 24-hour services in biling with bilingual live content. Uh, there's also rebroadcast arrangements where we broadcast onto other domestic players. I've al already mentioned shortwave. Now, shortwave is a complex and costly business. Uh, we've been in it for 70, more than 70 years, but in delivering shortwave, what we've noticed is declining audiences in a variety of markets, but stable audiences in others. So at the moment, in places like Burma or Papua New Guinea, shortwave is still important, but in other markets it's declined markedly. We deliver nine bilingual audio streams via the internet and increasingly with digital content tailored for the web for mobile devices, uh, including phones and tablets. So it's really important that we understand that the audiences in Asia and the Pacific are engaging probably more heavily than we think we are in Australia in the digital sphere. So we have to be connected and offering content in social media, mobile media and web media, otherwise we won't be reaching audiences in many markets. Yet we still have to provide the traditional media through shortwave and through FM broadcasting. So these broadcast methods I'm outlining uh, seem might seem confusing to you. They certainly seem confusing sometimes to those of us working in the industry. Uh, but what is clear is that uh, we are there and we're making significant efforts to reach audiences on multiple platforms. If you compare um, a market like Singapore, which is sophisticated and has access to just about every form of digital media you could think of, to a market like the Solomon Islands, where really there are still people who are living uh, in villages on islands in fairly, uh, with fairly limited resources. Those, the media habits and the media interests and the media capabilities of those people vary uh, significantly. So what I want to say there is we have to cater for all. It's not just a matter of catering for one. So let's move on to our sister network, uh, Australia Network. Uh, and Australia Network is an international television and digital service. Now, it's available to something like 31.2 million homes. It goes into 46 different countries in Asia and the Pacific, and it also goes into the Indian subcontinent. It's operated under a contestable contract with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for just over 10 years. And as I'm sure everybody here is very well aware, uh, last December, the government decided that after a lengthy process, Australia Network should become a permanent part of the ABC. It's really a welcome decision uh, and obviously it's consistent with the practice of many other uh, democratic countries such as the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, where in each case the government funds its international broadcaster. Australia Network reaches most of its television audiences through rebroadcast agreements across Asia and the Pacific, mainly with cable and satellite services, although some viewers uh, watch directly via satellite or rebroadcast free-to-air services, and that's available in some countries. Uh, several news bulletins a day are broadcast on Australia Network, tailored at peak viewing times to the audiences of Asia or at other times to audiences in the Pacific and indeed to the Indian subcontinent, and together uh, with the regionally focused daily current affairs programs, there's actually quite an, a significant amount of news and current affairs on Australia Network that is targeted to these regional audiences. In addition, Australia Network broadcasts some of the ABC's top news programs, and that includes things like uh, News Breakfast, Four Corners, or Australian Story. 
So in terms of general programming, Australia Network has to, under its contract that is, and that contract is still in place uh, at least up until August this year, uh, that con they have to actually broadcast Australian drama, they have to have children's programming, and they have to have uh, content that is not just from the ABC, but from commercial uh, arms as well. So the scheduling and selection of content that goes out on Australia Network through our news and current affairs programming, and Deborah Steele is here, who is the head of our Asia Pacific News Centre, that content is uh, specifically targeting these audiences, whereas a lot of the content that comes through the, um, through the drama and other content uh, through programming scheduling is actually the best of Australia and brought out to the world. Of course, there is also sport, and uh, that sport content is often fiercely watched, not just by international audiences, but by our expatriate audiences as well. I think uh, a lot of people think the expatriate audiences double or treble when AFL I is on Australian network. Um, so all I mentioned the Asia Pacific News Centre um, and what I would like to say about that is that it's located in Melbourne. It employs 55 journalists, which is quite a considerable number of journalists, uh, including many who can speak Asian and Pacific languages and uh, it's got full access to the ABC's 12 overseas bureau, uh, plus another four specific uh, correspondents who are specific for the international offering of the Asia Pacific News Centre. And uh, we operate in Auckland, Bangkok, Beijing, Jakarta, New Delhi, Port Moresby in Tokyo and other places beside. ABC International Development is another arm of the ABC's international offering and it's a very important one and one that you don't see because you don't, you don't hear it, you don't see it, uh, yet out there working very hard are people who are working for media development in a variety of different countries. Uh, it includes strategic advice, training, mentoring, technical support, we even have secondments. And the core goal of these activities is to build capacity for public interest media to support good governance. The programs align with the, strate the strategic objectives largely of AusAid, who's the primary funder, and ABC International Development advocates the benefits of what we call communication for development or the C for D approach. It considers how individuals or organisations with better access to information and opportunity to voice their opinions, how those people influence others in their community. It's a very important way of delivering media development. ABC International Development currently has staff on the ground and running some of these long-term projects, and those projects are in Cambodia, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and uh, it also manages the Pacific Media Development Scheme. It's a multi-million dollar scheme running over 10 years. Uh, it's run out of Vanuatu. Uh, by Francis Herman who works for us and it covers 14 nations of the Pacific for media development. It's a very big initiative uh, from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade through WASAID and a very important one. So that's a bit of an overview of the operations of the ABC International Division and uh, what we, I guess, offer into our community, how we get the message out. So why does the ABC engage in international broadcasting in the first place? And I guess you'd ask, why is it necessary to engage our neighbours and reflect Australian values, Australian opinions, Australian culture and promote an understanding of our daily life to these areas? We've got a long and proud history of broadcasting, uh, especially to the Asia-Pacific region through the Second World War, since the Second World War, I should say. I'd also like to note that international broadcasting isn't really optional as an extra it might have been considered that in the past, or some people might consider it now. But what I'd like to say is that at actually what we're talking about is not an op optional extra. Um, the ABC has to, under its charter, broadcast overseas. The charter, which is part of the ABC Act, by the way, uh, says that the corporation has to broadcast to countries outside Australia with programs of news, information and entertainment and to encourage an awareness of Australia and an understanding of Australian attitudes on world affairs. That's what the Act says. The rationale for our international services goes well beyond that, though. 
and the need to fulfil the requirements of the ABC Act is just part of it. Publicly funded international broadcasting is a core public diplomacy tool. It sits alongside scholarship, exchange programs, projects and cultural and sporting events as an important means for us influencing the peoples and the institutions of other nations. In 2007, a report on public diplomacy in Australia by the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade stressed that Australia is in intense competition with other countries also seeking to be heard on matters of importance to them. The competition since 2007 hasn't decreased, it's increased hugely, uh, especially as a result of massive amounts of money, which we'll talk about in a minute, being spent by other countries in order to have their influence uh, through soft power. In 2010, a Lowy Institute report argued that Australia needs to work more effectively on an international stage to ensure that there's a clarity and an understanding in the relationship between our nation and our emerging neighbours. This report indicated that central to this emphasis is media and the role that international broadcasters are expected to play in delivering that message. It described international broadcasting as, and I quote here, one of the principal means of presenting a country's perspective, views and values to foreign publics and their leaders. Now you only need to look at the huge resources devoted to organisations like the BBC, World Service, Voice of America, Deutsche Welle, and then you'll gain an insight into how important other countries, other nations view international broadcasting, especially as a means of soft power or public diplomacy. In that same Lowy report I was talking about in 2010, it revealed a stark difference in the funding across these uh, nations, the Western nations particularly. Australia spends, and this is with Radio Australia and Australia Network combined, about $34 million, um, and that's on, uh, on those two. The United Kin Kingdom, which has BBC World Service, um, there are two arms to BBC World Broadcasting. One is BBC World Service, funded entirely by the government, and the other is BBC Global News, which is funded commercially. Combined, they're massive. But what the government spends through the BBC World Service is $415 million. This is US dollars we're talking about. France, about $420 million. Uh, that's for a variety of different international service, services. Deutsche Welle through Germany, $370 million. And NHK World in Japan, about $226 million. And even on a per capita basis, Australia is way under in terms of our spend in terms of international broad broadcasting. At the same time, many non-Western and non-democratic countries are putting substantial resources into building up their international broadcasting as a major tool of soft diplomacy. According to The Economist, in August 2010, China had committed around $7 billion to international news. Now, I said the BBC was massive, with, uh, and that's only the government spend on the BBC at about $450 million. Multiply that by 15, and then you're getting roughly the size of spend we're talking about in terms of China here. So we're talking about large amounts of money going out. If you uh, look at these funding comparisons, I guess it highlights the aggressive nature that some countries are putting into soft power and public diplomacy as tools to influence other countries. In a speech delivered to Macquarie University in a 2009 ABC uh, in 2009, I should say, the ABC's managing director, Mark Scott, revealed that the $34 million I mentioned spent on the ABC's international offering is about the same spend as Mexico and 50% smaller than Singapore. So given the threat of better funded global competition and the increased choice encouraged and promoted by available new media technologies, there appears to be no shortage of countries spending those big budgets in 2009, Philip Seep, he's a leading professor of journalism and public diplomacy, and he's also a professor of international relations at the University of Southern California. He published a paper which identified the rise of public diplomacy through international broadcasting, and he observed that, uh, and again, this is a, uh, a direct take, 
A hostile public undermines friendship between governments, which makes it difficult for goals and policy objectives to be achieved. Professor Joseph Nye, who's a senior academic and a former US government advisor, was in Australia last week, and in a meeting the ABC International team had with him, uh, he provided some theoretical and practical insights into the theory of soft power, of which public diplomacy is a significant component. In brief, Professor Nye distinguishes between a nation's hard power, and I'm sure many of you know about this, so I won't go into it in detail, but um, hard power is threat or coercion to uh, have influence. Soft power is the ability to uh, persuade people through being attractive. Now, I'm not talking about physically attractive here. Um, and one of Nye's many and respected publications, uh, he says, soft power is a dance that requires partners. Now, what he means by that is it's a two-way interaction between the communicating parties. It's not a one-way thing. For us in ABC International, what we can take is that it means connecting with audiences. It means using a language that people know so that they can actually understand you and come back to you. It means being on a platform that they're using. There's no point in going to a dance and wanting to dance with somebody, but there's no stage. It means allowing them to have a voice in this two-way dance. There's no point in being a dancer and, and wanting to have the lead all the time. Uh, you know, this is actually something that is a partnership. In his most recent publication, which is titled The Future of Power, Nye states that governments trying to utilise public diplomacy to wield soft power face new problems. While attempting to promote the attractive images of our country, it's not a new concept, by the way, the conditions for trying to create soft power have changed dramatically in recent years with the development of new technologies, better informed societies, and an emerging developing world with alternate value systems. So with specific respect to media, Nye, this is Joseph Nye again, advocates that media is the most suitable means of communicating a nation's culture and value system to publics of other nations, and he notes that information is power and modern information technology is spreading information more widely than ever before in any time of history on the globe. So on whether the media should be state-owned, and by that I don't mean state-run, I mean uh, owned and uh, funded by the government, such as the ABC, or whether it should be uh, purely commercial, uh, then what Nye has to say is that uh, commercially, um, we both have a, a very important role to play here, communicating a nation's thoughts and value systems. But he does warn against the use of, of soft power in the hands of only one area. So in other words, what he's saying is, if you only have commercial media coming out of your country, uh, he says, market forces portray only the profitable mass dimensions of, and he's talking about America here, of our culture. And that would reinforce foreign images of the United States as a one-dimensional country. What he's arguing there is that if you allow market forces and commercial business to run your soft power, the dimensions that you're offering to uh, the other countries are very, very limited indeed. The Lowy Institute identified several elements needed for a successful international broadcasting service, such as adequate funding, a clear strategic goal and continuity. But despite all of those things, what they said was most important was editorial independence. Uh, and the reason that they've said that is uh, what we're going to talk about now. As Australia's primary pu public broadcaster with a charter, as I've already mentioned, it requires editorial independence and integrity, the ABC's international services are able to provide a credible national perspective that's perceived as neither propaganda nor the product of the co a commercial agenda that we were just talking about in relation to Nye's comments. As such, we provide a fully rounded picture of Australia, at least that's what we attempt to do, with its positives and with its negatives. And this is one of the other things that Joseph and I talks about. It's not very good to go up and only talk about the positive things of your society 
you actually have to talk about yourself warts and all. Uh, and the ABC attempts to portray Australia as a pluralistic country with enormous amounts of debate and a country that uh, reflects on itself as, and uh, if you like, argues with itself as well as portraying itself uh, in a fairly good light as well. I've mentioned our role as much more than one-way communication between us and the audience. We're also engaging our audiences in dialogue so that they can express their opinions, their perspectives and their attitudes. We want their values and we want to know what their approach is. It's more important today than ever before for people to feel that their voice is being heard. Their opinions are being valued and you don't have to agree with the person's opinions to value them, but you do have to listen to them. In the old days of shortwave radio and snail radio and snail mail, that wasn't easy to do. It was really difficult to engage your audiences halfway around the globe you know, via shortwave. You know, a, a letter might arrive six weeks or two months later and you've forgotten what you were talking about. But in to today, of course, we've got SMS, we've got social media, we've got uh, things like Facebook, of course, or uh, Zingme or others. Um, and so the audiences are communicating with us from around the world instantly. It's a completely different environment we're in today than we were 15 years ago. We also contribute to creating local dialogues. ABC International Development has a unit as a unit, uh, has played a key role in uh, introducing talkback radio for the first time in Cambodia and improving its use in the Pacific, especially in Papua New Guinea. The ABC has a strong record of performance as Australia's international broadcaster, and we do reach millions of people in Asia and the Pacific in several languages, as I've already mentioned, on all these platforms. Indeed, the ABC's reach and influence is quite impressive. Uh, if you consider it against the other G20 countries uh, that we talked about before. So what I want to do now is focus on a couple of key areas. You'll recall that in September last year, Prime Minister Julia Gillard recognised that um, Asia was very important by launching a, pro a process to write a white paper, and that paper is, of course, on Australia in the Asian century. Uh, the task force is being headed by former Treasury Secretary Ken Henry. The ABC provided a substantial submission to the task force, and if you want to look at that submission, it's available on the task force website. Now, as that audience, as you in this audience would be aware, Asia is now home to 60% of the world's population and 30% of the world's land mass. It's home to China and it's home to India. Those are the two most populous nations of the world and two of the fastest growing economies of the world. Asia will play an increasing role in the global economy, there's no doubt about it. According to the World Bank, China may become the largest economy in the world sometime around 2020 or going up to 2030. Some have predicted that Asia's share of global GDP will reach 50% by 2050. Now, that's a lot. Um, According to Professor Nye, though, all that's going to do is restore the situation to the way it was about 200 years ago, when Asia had roughly half the world's population and supplied about half the world's production. So he's arguing that we're just heading back to the balance that we had. And the reason that we went out of balance is the Industrial Revolution and that North America and Europe, through the Industrial Revolution managed to move rapidly ahead, started producing on a scale never seen before in the world and left Asia behind. But what's happening now, of course, is Asia's catching up at a very, very rapid rate. The forecast for Asian economies in the coming years um, balances those strong growth patterns with the need to address a range of potential constraints. And what I'm talking about there is uh, openness to trade and competition, skill shortages, demographic changes, social cohesion, and the stability of the political environment. Australia is deeply enmeshed in Asian markets. To have an impact on the international stage, Australia will increasingly need to engage in the politics, the economy, the diplomacy 
of the Asian region. Our resources boom and domestic economic management have protected us from the worst of the global financial crisis and have deepened our trade ties with the large economies of China, India, Japan, South Korea and the ASEAN states. Increased affluence and global competition is also bringing Asia closer to Australia. For instance, it's now cheaper to fly to Hanoi or, say, Hong Kong than it is to fly to many parts of regional Australia. And so our ties into Asia are both physically and economically stronger than they have been. The rise of the networked economy also means that Australia is increasingly connected to Asia for business on a person-to-person -person basis. Technology stripping away national borders and it's making it easier for the citizens of this country to communicate with each other and with uh, people in Asia and the Pacific. So Australia's prosperity is linked to engagement with and integration into Asia. Our most important trading partners are no longer solely located in the developed world and our pattern of trade has shifted markedly. The ABC's international broadcasting services play a significant role in explaining Australia's growing relationship with Asia. There's no question about that. Not only in terms of what our nation has to offer, but also by explaining the debates within Australia about how best to work with the region. In addition, Radio Australia and Australia Network describe through the wide variety of content, and I, I've talked about some of that content before, that we are a dynamic, advanced and stable multicultural society that goes well beyond the stereotypes of beaches and kangaroos. Within Australia, there's also growing demand for information about the perspectives on Asia and the implications for Australia in the Asian century. As I'm going to talk about in a minute, the ABC is playing an important role in this regard of bringing Asia and the Pacific and the world back into Australia in terms of media. At a strategic level, uh, <coughs> Professor Nye again argued in, a, in his recent lecture at Macquarie University, the rise of new powers tends to create fear among others that can lead to conflict. In particular, he said the rise of China is already creating suspicion across the region and in the United States. It's therefore not unreasonable to argue that the rise of China and India as great powers is yet a further reason for Australia to enhance its soft power capabilities and to open up communications across the region through international broadcasting. Australia will always have limited hard power and while we can shelter under, say, our alliances with the US and others, uh, we also have to make our own way in the region and that includes influencing and being influenced by uh, Asian people with reliable news and information from an Australian perspective and bringing back the Asian perspective into this country. I'd like to say that no other international broadcaster, and I, whether it's the BBC, Voice of America, CNN, Deutsche Welle, none of them will provide an ongoing focus on explaining Australia to Australians uh, and Australia and Australia's relationship with Asia and the Pacific. So it's up to us to ensure that Australia's voice is heard and it's also up to us to ensure that we hear the voice of our neighbours. The case for broadcasting into the Pacific is slightly different and into PNG. As you're probably aware, Papua New Guinea receives more Australian aid than any other country in the world. Uh, and most Pacific Island countries are also heavily dependent on Australia for aid. Australia's growing economic interests in the Pacific, particularly in the resources sector, uh, are moving us forward. Moreover, Papua New Guinea and the Pacific <coughs> Islands are information poor. That's because of low levels of economic development and growth and often low levels of literacy. So those countries struggle to maintain basic media infrastructure and that's whether it's private or public media. Uh, and so it's a real imbalance in relation to their capacity, that is the Pacific's capacity to keep up to date with the changes that are taking place in this connected world. So it's a major problem in terms of developing and maintaining democratic institutions. Uh, if you want a well-informed society, if you want a really functioning democracy, then there needs to be a balance between information uh, and the capacity for people to uh, have input 
into the debate of that democratic society. In addition, many Pacific societies have been through recent periods of instability, and uh, I'm sure we don't have to think hard to go back to the Fiji coups, uh, the separatist uh, troubles in Bougainville, uh, the Solomon Islands where Ramsey played such a significant role, and even in Papua New Guinea at the moment, there's quite considerable problems associated uh, with that democracy. So uh, as the largest country, and I would also say the largest economy in the South Pacific, Australia is expected to play the leading role in the region, and we're expected by those countries to do this, not just by ourselves and by others, such as the United States, we're expected to play the biggest role in providing stability and support and development and as far as we can make that development free of corruption. In that context, context the provision of reliable and trusted news information that we provide through Australia Network and Radio Australia, it's really important. It can't be underestimated how important it is. I should say it can't be overestimated how important it is. Uh, Australia is sometimes seen by, by the Pacific neighbours, though, as a dominating power. Radio Australia and Australia Network, therefore, have to take a really careful approach to ensure that our services give as much opportunity as possible for the Pacific Islanders to voice their own opinions, not just be dominated by our own. It's also reflected in ABC International Development's programs to promote effective Pacific media organisations, which also um, have a significant contribution to keeping their voters informed in their local countries. I shared the stage just recently at a uh, conference of the Commonwealth Broadcasting Association with Mamafu Kapira, who's the Managing Director of New Guinea Broadcasting Corporation. And on stage, we were talking about the absolute importance of collaboration, of two-way dialogue, of Australia being a partner, but not, not being the sole leader, that this is a partnership approach, not just with Papua New Guinea, but with all of the nations in uh, the Pacific. So I want to move on now to uh, the digital revolution. Um, I've talked a little bit about it, but it's massive. Uh, if you think about the advanced countries, such as Japan, Korea and Singapore, everybody has ready access to television, radio and the digital economy. But if you go to other countries, and some of those are in Asia, as well as in the Pacific, if we've talked about Burma and Papua New Guinea, or even the Solomon Islands, those countries don't have the same access to the rapidly increasing digital environment and digital media, but they've nevertheless had a revolution take place through mobile phones, which are now having massive impact on those countries. The rollout of mobile phones is incredible. Um, of course, uh, regulatory regimes also vary fairly widely. In many regional countries, rebroadcast arrangements are possible. And so we can actually go in and have a partnership with a local broadcaster who actually broadcasts our material. Uh, some internet uh, swapping of material is possible. Uh, but in other countries, it's much, much more difficult because those countries won't allow foreign broadcasters to come in. They won't even allow their domestic broadcasters to run foreign material. Um, for example, in India, uh, it's still illegal for a, a radio station, other than All India Radio, which is government run, to carry news from a foreign broadcaster. In fact, it's illegal for commercial broadcasters, uh, radio broadcasters in India to carry news. Only All India Radio can carry news. There are very, very different regimes in terms of the regulation that we uh, are operating in. So what I'm trying to describe to you is diversity in connectedness, diversity in regulation, and diversity in a variety of other aspects uh, so it complicates our capacity to provide content and to engage with audiences. Um, be, and e even within one small region, there are huge differences that we have to uh, contend with. So I talked about the massive uptake of digital technology. I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, in January this year, it was reported around 500 million Chinese people are on the internet 
So that's half a billion people in China. And that's, I guess, more than the combined population of uh, Japan and the United States. Um, though the vast majority of those people are in urban areas, not in rural areas in China. In March last year, about 100 million internet users in India, 28 million internet users in Vietnam, 40 million in Indonesia, 17 million in Malaysia. They vary, of course, uh, but rapid growth is the... Uh, is the curve that we're talking about here. The figures also show that internet users tend to be younger and more affluent, although interestingly enough, in some of the Western countries, there's research that tends to indicate the dominant internet users and social media users are middle-aged women. Um, and that's not universal across the world, but what this is telling us is that the complexities of the digital environment and the way people use media, it's we're talking about very, very complicated systems operating across the world and massive uptake in a variety of different, uh, different demographic areas. But um, mobile phones is probably the area where everybody would acknowledge that in the, both in the developed and the developing world, that's where things have changed mo most. It's smartphones in the developed world where people access the internet particularly easily uh, in the developing world, 2G phones rolling out so that almost everybody, but not quite, but almost everybody can now have access to a phone. Whereas if you went back 20 or less than 20, if you went back 10 years ago, some of these people had never even spoken on a telephone, never even seen a telephone. Um, in 2010, about 64% of Chinese owned a mobile phone. So we're two years later now. It, that percentage will be a lot higher. In Indonesia, 91% own a mobile phone. In Vietnam, about 175% own a mobile phone. I'll let you work out how. More importantly, um, I think you can say a third of mobile phone users um, in China are on the net with their phone. In Indonesia, that's higher. It's about 48% and about 29% of Vietnamese are using their mobile phone to access the internet. Some of these people will not be using TV or radio. Some of these people will only be engaging with media via these mobile devices. Many of these people will not be able to afford a computer, but they are our audience and we have to reach these people. Now, I'm not just talking about Asia here. In 2001, PNG had only 10,000 mobile phone users. Anybody want to guess how many they have today? 10,000 it was about 10 years ago. Now it's 1.9 million. That's in a population base of 6 to 7 million people. And so we're talking about you know, 30 to 40 percent of the country's population in one of the poorest countries of the world having mobile phones. I think it uh, you know, tells us a lot. Um, so it's important to note that Asia's social media landscape, yes, it's diverse, yes, it's fragmented. It uses different types of interaction in different markets. And what I'm talking about here especially is the social media environment. If you think about Facebook and Twitter, most people think of them as universal. And if you're in uh, Australia or in Indonesia, you'd be right. Uh, but if you go to China, you won't be able to, and many of you I know have, you won't be able to access Facebook, you won't be able to access many of your websites. But the reality is, in China, social media is taking off uh, like a rocket. They just use different forms. They use um, Sino Weibo and other forms. And what we have to do, and it's an interesting anecdote here, in order to connect with people inside China by getting an, in and using the social media platforms in Mandarin that Chinese people are using, we've started to connect with Chinese people and have communication coming back to us for the first time. We've never had any interaction with people inside China. We broadcast out there and we think, we hope, that using these shortwave media we get many, many people. And in the past we used to get a few letters. But they, as I said, they come months later or years later from China. But now, with only two months 
you know, uh, with only two months of practicing inter interaction with people in China, we are really able to connect and to get messages back. And that's just the beginning of the social media revolution. So what social media is doing, and by the way, the BBC and Deutsche Welle and Voice of America are all investing heavily in the same area of social media to connect with audiences. So what we're doing is enabling our audience to participate with us no matter where they are. So if they're interested in Australian issues and Australian values, then they will connect with us. So I guess I've tried to pay, paste to paint and then paste up this picture of, uh, of what we're doing in ABC International in the context of the importance of us engaging with and receiving messages back from our audiences in this two-way exchange, in a collaborative me method, in order to have a friendly neighbourhood. If we don't have this friendly neighbourhood, and if we are not perceived as good neighbours by the Indonesians and by the people of Papua New Guinea and by the people of China and by the people of India, then our levels of engagement and our capacity for future advancement and participation in the Asian century are going to be particularly limited. I, uh, I had a few other things that I was going to talk about, but I think rather than do that right now, I'd just like to conclude um, by saying this. Um, when Senator Conroy announced that uh, there was, he's the communications minister, most of you know, announced that uh, the Australian network would be coming to the ABC on a permanent basis. He made it clear that he expected that there would be an opportunity for Radio Australia and Australia Network uh, to take advantage of the multi-platform international media operation and converge. And so that could be converge in the digital area and converge in the way that we produce our content. So what we're moving to into the future is an opportunity for, instead of separate arms going out through Australia Network and Radio Australia, that we have one ABC International offering into the future that offers this multi-language, multi-platform content that reaches people on the devices of their choice, in the country, in the language of their choice, so that they have opportunity to engage with, understand and participate with the Australian people uh, much better than they have been able to in the past. And that's work that we're just undertaking at the moment. So I'd just like to say thank you all very much for um, allowing me the opportunity to come and have a bit of a discussion. Uh, it tends to be complicated in some aspects of our operation and complicated in the context that soft power is not just about engaging with audiences through the delivery of content. It's about understanding one another, mutual respect, and giving ourselves and our audiences opportunity to communicate effectively in a dialogue.